Hi, my name is Jan Schirer. I'm from RMIT University in Melbourne and Barcelona, and I actually currently live in Barcelona during the COVID era. I'm going to talk about three stories today in the context of transit activated corridors lessons from Europe. Um, they will look at the big picture, the medium picture, and the small picture. Helsinki, the capital of Finland, has a very ambitious transformation strategy for some of its inner urban expressways, many of which look like this. So they really are high speed roads with no buildings around them. This one here already has a high profile public transport, as you can see on the right, but others don't. And the idea is to transform them into something that looks a little bit like this, adding urban intensity, adding public transport, and of course, making them more amenable for pedestrians and cyclists, reducing the traffic, slowing down the traffic. And that sounds like a wonderful idea on paper, of course, but it did actually create a planning conflict. And I'm going to explain it. Here's a map of Helsinki. You can see towards the center left, you can see the traditional mixed use high density uh, central area of Helsinki. And the area shaded in dark are the ones that actually surround these expressways that approach the inner city. So the city of Helsinki is intending to expand its core city into these new areas and also expand the core city qualities of high density and mixed use, using mostly large rail and tram extensions uh, to service these areas. Now, of course, the city of Helsinki um, is part of a wider metropolitan region. It is not just about the core city. There are 14 other municipalities which uh, together actually double the number of inhabitants of the greater Helsinki area. And many of these areas are very road based. There's a number of large roads outside the core city, ring roads, radial roads and all that. And the municipalities outside the core city of, of Helsinki had a different view about what, con what constitutes sustainable transport and also what constitutes polycentricity um, of decentralization of city center functions. They basically wanted a piece of the cake and they said, if we actually make some of our roads slower, that will mean that the connections between the disparate parts of the metropolitan areas will become less effective. And this does not just affect cars and trucks, it also affects express buses and express buses actually form a quite important part of the public transport network in the Helsinki metropolitan area, particularly away from the rail corridors. So there was a dispute um, between the city of Helsinki, which said, we actually want to reduce car traffic. We want to create a public transport oriented urban fabric, and we want to use it to decentralize our own core city and the surrounding municipalities who said this is going to weaken polycentricity at a regional scale. So it came to a court case um, and in the court case it was decided that uh, these two views were partly irre irreconcilable and four out of the seven planned corridors were actually cancelled. So the program of boulevardization is still going ahead in, re in a reduced format and the city of Helsinki together with the municipalities are also coming up with a new joint strategy so they agree on what they actually want. And here are some images of how some of these expressways are going to be turned into boulevards and how they are going to have a much denser and much more intense and transit oriented urban form. But the lesson from Helsinki is still that it is important to be clear about these goals. Um, lofty words like sustainable transport and decentralization mean different things to different people. And these things actually have to be negotiated. And um, this is something that the city of Helsinki has learned, not without friction, but the process is ongoing. The second story I would like to talk about today is more about the medium picture. And this has a lot to do with what sort of public transport mode are we actually using to achieve these um, transit activated corridors? Can we diversify medium public transport away from light rail? Tramways and light rail are and have been the most popular medium capacity public transport mode for quite some time, but um, they are neither cheap nor quick uh, to, enter, to, to implement. So we've been talking in the, in the context of this project, we've been talking a lot about the trackless tram, which offer the opportunity to create more medium capacity public transport for less investment costs. 
But what is actually the on-the-ground experience with similar um, technologies introduced into this whole conundrum of pu building public transport and enabling urban intensification? And we'll first look at France because there's actually quite a few interesting examples from France dating back now 10, 15 years about introducing a different rubber tire technology of tram which look like this. This is actually an example from Italy, but it's a similar technology. The original idea was that these systems should be cheaper to implement because they use up less space and, and require a less, in, less intensive transformation of the street space. So this has been implemented on two lines in Paris and in uh, three other French cities, Caen, Nancy and Clermont-Ferrand, as well as in two Italian cities, Padova and Venezia, Mestre. Here's an image of the trans and light rail lines that have been built in the Paris region over the past 30 years. In red, you can see the conventional tram lines. In like magenta purple, you can see the rubber tire trams. That's two lines, one in the north and one in the southwest. And then in light red, you can see the, the routes that are still planned or under construction at the time this map was compiled. So I've made a little overview of the cost per kilometer of infrastructure of these different types of uh, tram routes. There's about 10 that have actually been put into service since 1992. These are the investment costs, including the rolling stock of the initial stages of each route at the time of the project approval. Now, big disclaimer here, these numbers have been compiled from Wikipedia and it's unknown whether the quality of the data is compatible. But I think what these numbers actually don't tell us is that the rubber tire trams highlighted here in purple are significantly cheaper to build than the conventional trams. So in the sense, the French experience with rubber tire tram systems fell a bit flat. Um, because of the cost, but also, or the disappointing news about the cost, but also because there were teething problems with the new technology. It was considered unreliable. Um, and there was also a dependence on the proprietary systems of particular manufacturers. So in Paris, um, there's two rubber tied lines out of 10 and all the future lines will actually be built as conventional trams. In other cities, including Caen, which is actually quite an interesting example, the rubber tire tram opened in 2002. This is what it looked like, but when Car actually decided to expand its system, it realized that it couldn't do it on this technology because the manufacturer had stopped building it. So this led after only 15 years to a quite costly conversion of the entire system to a conventional tram, and which also resulted in an 18 month closure of this particular part of the public transport system. What this also led to because of the additional expense is that the second corridor that Carl wanted to build through its city had to be delayed by about 15 years and will now only be completed in about 2030. The other city that used the same technology in RC will actually uh, take out the rubber tire tram altogether and go back to buses. And uh, the third city, Clermont-Ferrand, has also said that once the vehicle's life expires, probably in the 2030s, they will also convert it into a conventional tram. So this is what the conventional tram in car looks like. It opened in 2019 and the conversion costs as much again as the original build of the rubber tire tram. Now, what I'm learning from these France case studies is there is actually quite strong national government support in France for medium capacity transit in cities. And there's even a dedicated local payroll tax that municipalities have to fund it or to help fund it. But there's also a threat here for transport technology choices to introduce this unnecessary partisan element into the decision-making process. And that can distract from the main game and obstruct or delay the associated transition process. And I'd like to show another example from Sweden. This is the city of Lund, which is a relatively small city, 120,000 people, but it's part of a larger metropolitan region, which also comprises another city of a similar size, Helsingborg, and a larger city, 350,000 people, Malmö. They're all within easy commuting distance, 20 minutes, 30 minutes from each other. And sometime over the last decade or decade and a half, they all had this idea of introducing light rail. The last tram in Malmö ran in the 1970s. So at the end, only Lund actually introduced light rail, while 
the other two cities um, settle for bus rapid transit, which is cheaper to build, but that also has less of an impact. So this large red system in Lund only opened in 2020, last year. And it actually replaced an existing bus rapid transit system. There were several reasons for it. It was about the bus system reaching its capacity limits. It was acknowledged that large rail has a higher capacity than the bus rapid transit has. There was also an intention to accommodate a lot of growth in a particular greenfield site. It facilitates a higher intensity of this kind of development than what was possible in the neighboring cities. It is also a corridor that is lined with a number of education, university and health facilities, and particularly a very prestigious new international research facility. The thinking was a prestigious a research facility which gets thousands of visitors visiting researchers every year should also have a prestigious public transport system serving it. And I think the important story here is the Council of Lund was actually relatively unanimous in the support for, for, for light rail. Not entirely unanimous, there was opposition, there still is opposition, but um, what was actually possible in that kind of situation where there was a large pro-large rail majority was to mobilize major national government contribution, contributions to, to building the scheme. And um, that has not been possible in, its, in the same way in Malmö and in housing and in housing Bohr. So here's Malmö, same color, same transport operator, but a different kind of transport technology and a different kind of vehicle. So this is part of the bus rapid transit system. It even looks a little bit like a tram, but the capacity is lower and the performance is probably also lower because it uses public streets to a large extent. It also has some of its own right of way. It has less of an impact on urban development that's been shown. It follows development rather than guiding it. But the city of Malmö has decided that uh, this is what they could do. There was much more controversy at, at the political level and much less ability to actually mobilize the kind of funding from the national government that would have been required to get a more expensive and higher profile system. So they're rolling this out. It's not bad, but I think what we really need to understand here is that uh, it is not uncommon for quite significant controversies to surround the introduction of medium capacity transit, whether it's light rail, trackless trams or bus rapid transit. And the technical system discussions can actually be quite a distraction that cause delays, that cause underachievement. And um, generally, I would say if light rail systems already exist, it makes a lot of sense to expand them. While new technologies like trackless trams are probably most suited to areas where there are currently only buses or heavy rail and where a huge performance gap is there um, that needs to be filled by medium capacity transit. So what are these sources of conflict at the local level? And that's actually the last part of my talk. It's more about the small picture. It's about what is the relationship between medium capacity public transport and the streetscape? It is usually the greatest source of local level policy conflicts. Um, many stakeholders and the political supporters tend to defend their turf here. Public transport operators have different interests from motorists and motorists in their function as moving their vehicles or parking their vehicles from pedestrians, from cyclists, from retailers, from outdoor hospitality, from landscapers, and they try to do this in very constrained spaces in, in urban environments. Because accommodating every need of that is articulated by different stakeholders often results in very cluttered streetscapes with very limited amenity that don't really work well for any group. And uh, I think many of Melbourne's inner urban tram corridors illustrate that. It's a very iconic public transport system, the Melbourne tram, but it is also underperforming. It's one of the slowest tram systems in the world. In outer urban areas, uh, trying to accommodate every stakeholder's need often results in very wide road reserves. More space than needed is dedicated to roads and uh, that distracts from the kind of urbanity that we're actually trying to achieve in this transformation towards 21st century boulevards. So what's been happening here on Passage San Juan in Barcelona in the early 2010s is a major conversion of uh, traffic space to people space, including with some permeable surfaces here, which is also good for water management. 
There's been no specific intensification strategy in this boulevard because the urban environment here has already been very dense. This is the 19th century urban fabric, Echampla in Barcelona. The objective here is to serve the existing density with better public spaces. The bicycle lane here sits in the center. That's something Barcelona does a lot. It's a bit controversial in other places. But what you can also see here is that what remains of uh, general traffic lanes is two traffic lanes, two buses, a taxi lanes, and no parking. Now, Barcelona in the 2010s also did a very comprehensive bus network reform, converting what was a spaghetti ball type of system into a much more leg legible grid system. And two of these routes actually follow Passage San Juan. There are also three metro stations, but the metro lines run perpendicular to the boulevard, not along it. So as a general conclusion, Visioning can help, design exercises, as we've seen in Barcelona, can help, but they need to be embedded in a continuous and constructive dialogue of decision makers with stakeholders to determine what should the future of urban space actually look like.